Well, welcome. I'm so honored to be with you this morning. Welcome all of you in cyberspace who are watching this morning. You know, I don't know if you've seen the um, coming attraction for the new Pixar movie. It's called Inside Out. Have any of you seen that? Yeah. Um, basically, it's an animation of the voices inside of our head. Does that frighten anyone else? <laughs> yeah. And today's talk is going to um, come out of a voice that was inside my head. And you should be afraid. You should be very, very afraid. <laughs> You know, recently, a couple months ago, I got to spend some time with our uh, new grads before they walked across this very stage, and congratulations to any of you who are there or here this morning or listening. We're so proud of you. We just bless you on your journey. <laughs> and so I was at dinner with them, and they were talking with excitement about the ministry that they were going to do, and some of them were interviewing, and there was just this energy of hope and joy and wonder and innocence and beauty and, and this desire to go out and change the world. Well, yesterday was my 13th anniversary of ordination, and so um, it's been a little while since I was in that place. But as I watched them and watched them just full of this energy, I thought about my journey in the last 13 years. You see, in that 13 years, I've, exquisite, I've, I've experienced exquisite joy, the joy of christening babies and christening new churches, <laughs> the honor of being with people at the most intimate moments of their life. There is no greater honor. And I've also experienced the heartache and disappointment that sometimes comes with life on this human earth, doesn't it? The 13 years in which I have been a minister have blessed me in ways I can't even tell you, both the joy and the pain. And there was a four-year period not so long ago in which I experienced more of the latter. On a personal level, I had loss after loss of letting go after letting go, change after change. I said goodbye to my parents who I'd been caring for, my dad who had Alzheimer's. They left the earth within three months of one another. And I ended a marriage that had blessed me throughout my life. I had really grown up in that marriage. The father of my children and I raised three wonderful beings and yet it was time to let it go. I experienced betrayal, change, everything that I had found to bring me security or safety, anything that I was attached to, any way that I had defined myself was challenged, changed, or lost. And in a way, I was turned inside out during that four-year period, even at times feeling betrayed by my own instincts, betrayed by my own faith. It was truly what the mystics call a dark night of the soul. Well, as I sat watching these students and thinking about that journey, the question I pondered was, would I go back? I remembered that, that just feeling of being unleashed on the world, the joy of spirit that filled me, that, that innocence that I had then, and a little bit of arrogance, I must say. And I heard this voice that said, would you uneat the apple? Now, I know for you linguists out there, because I am one, you're sitting there going, uneat, really? I don't think that's a word. <laughs> but who are we to question the voice of God? And that's what I heard. Would you uneat the apple? 
Well, I sat with that for days. I sat with that question and wondered, what did it really mean? So I had to pull out my Bible, go back to the book of Genesis, and read. Genesis chapter 3, verse 1 through 5. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other wild animal that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God say you shall not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the tree in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden, nor shall you touch it, or you shall die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Well, we know how the rest of that story goes. She ate, he ate, their eyes were opened and they realized they were naked. And man, there's been a lot done with that story over the years, hasn't there? Well, first of all, if we just entertain this story and we look at it, we have to think about the fact that what's the first thing you're going to do when somebody says, don't touch that? Exactly. I can see you're with me here. There's a lot of mischievous people out there. There was a whole episode um, of Modern Family that some of you may have caught in which they went to Caltech because Alex was thinking about going there. And so Alex and her mom went off to view the campus. And Phil and Luke uh, saw a flyer that said $50 for anybody willing to do this science experiment. So they thought, well, we've got some time and nothing to do. And so Haley went along with them and they were signed their names, were ushered into this room and they were sitting in this room and they realized that they thought there was a, a two-way mirror on one wall. And then on the other wall was a button that said, do not push in big letters. Well, you can imagine if you're a fan of the show, the conversation that followed. And it really became each of them looking into themselves at their mischievous side, trying to decide, they had decided that these scientists that had invited them into this experiment must be on the other side of that mirror watching them, watching their every move, analyzing how they would respond to this. And so at first, the desire was, we've got to push the button. We're going to be rebels. We can't let something stop us. And then Haley, who has been the rebel all her life, was like, no, I've been there. I've done that. It's time for some order. We have to follow the rules. So they went back and forth, back and forth, until they decided as a united front they were going to push that button because they weren't going to let some monkey on the other side of that mirror laugh at them. And so... Together, they went and pushed the button, and they waited. And about 30 seconds later, the research assistant came running in and said, did you touch that button? And they said, yes, we did. And he said, that button turns on the air conditioning, and there's no way we can turn it off. Come to find out, the $50 was for a survey they were supposed to take, and the mirror was just a mirror on the wall. So the story goes, they ate the apple and they realized they were naked. Well, you know, if you look at this image of the serpent, it goes back way before the Bible. It's one of the most ancient mythological symbols. And in many traditions, the serpent represents wisdom. What became of that question for me, would you uneat the apple? became an exploration of innocence versus wisdom. Charles Fillmore says that the Garden of Eden represents a region of being in which all are provided, all primal ideas for the production of the beautiful. It is a place where all possibilities can grow. It says in the book of Genesis, if you eat, you will die. But what is it you will die to? Those things in our life that break us apart, that 
make us feel naked and vulnerable and raw? Are the things that allow us to die to our false self, they're the things that allow us to die to illusion. Our life experiences and the things that we walk through are the things that awaken us to the knowledge of good and evil. Good being that which evolves us and evil being that which shows us what we are not. We must walk through the experiences of loss, of betrayal, of heartache. We must be broken down in order to be broken open if we truly, truly want to know enlightenment, if we truly want to open ourselves to the spiritual path because we can't know who we are until we know who we are not. Does it feel good? Hell no. No, there are moments that feel like complete crap. I'm sure you've all had them. But we can be grateful for the experiences and the people and the events that take us into the darkness so that we can see the light. Just this week, I let go of a friend of mine who was 42 years old and died of a rare genetic form of cancer. And as I sat with him and held his hand and we talked about what he was experiencing and what he was going through, I was amazed at the peace he felt. There were tears, yes. There was heartache, yes. There was regret. But he said, you know, throughout his life, he'd been one of the most generous people I knew. I got to know his family a little bit better and see the way that he touched their lives, including his 15-year-old nephew, who he was like a father to. And I heard stories I hadn't heard before about this young man. But what I knew about Sean was that although he was a gracious giver, he had a hard time receiving and experiencing love. And what he told me in those final moments of his life was that it was his dying that allowed him to finally open up to that. It was in his dying he found meaning. It was in his dying he found purpose. For he had decided to donate his body to science in the hopes that there could be a cure for this rare cancer. And although we may not be going through a physical death, it is in our dying, our dying to illusion, our dying to our false self, that we are awakened. Some of you that um, are basketball fans may know of a young man named Jay Williams. Jay Williams was an amazing college basketball player, thought to be, you know, the next Michael Jordan. He was recruited by the Bulls, looked to have a promising career ahead of him, until a devastating mistake took it all away. It destroyed his career and tested his will to live. Because you see, in his contract, he had a line that prohibited him from riding motorcycles, among other things, because of course they want to protect their investment and the people on the team. But he did it anyway. And one day he was out on his motorcycle and he crashed. He broke both of his legs along with a number of other bones in his body. Over that period of recovery, he was consumed, consumed with what could have been. He began to be known as the guy who threw away his career. He even attempted suicide twice. He struggled in that knowing that there was something he could have had that he, by his own actions, destroyed. But the turning point for him, he says, was when that he realized surrendering to the pain was part of what comes next. That it wasn't until he could really be with that instead of trying to avoid it or escape it that he would understand what his purpose was. And as he opened up to that, he saw how if he had remained on that career path, he would have lost himself. He said, I probably would have done drugs, cheated on my wife. 
I was losing the man I knew that I could be. And he now says, my destiny is still great. It just looks a little different. He is now an analyst for ESPN. He mentors young basketball players, and he's writing a book called Life is Not an Accident. Those uncomfortable, painful experiences, when we are present to them, open us up to what is true if we let them. But here is the key. And I want you all to take a deep breath because this is going to sound like blasphemy coming from a unity stage. But stay with me. In order to find the enlightenment we seek, in order to truly know God, in order to truly know the joy and the love that is possible, we have to come from a place that wants truth more than it wants to feel good. One of the books that saved me during my, my dark night of the soul is called The End of Your World by Adi Ashante, who I've come to know and value as a brilliant teacher. And he says, we must give up the pursuit of positive emotional states through spiritual practice. The path of awakening is not about positive emotions. On the contrary, enlightenment may not be easy or positive at all. It is not easy to have our illusions crushed. It is not easy to let go of long-held perceptions. We may experience great resistance to seeing through even those illusions that have caused us a great amount of pain. Waking up to the ways we have deceived ourselves is sometimes painful. He goes on to say, if our orientation is simply to feel better in each moment, then we'll continue to delude ourselves. In order to awaken, we must break out of the paradigm of always seeking to feel better. We are being called to be present to every moment of our lives. And yes, sometimes it feels magnificent, and, magnificent, and yes, sometimes it feels like crap. But if we are present to it, if we allow life to refine us, if we allow life to open us, then the gift that awaits us is immeasurable. He goes on to say, with the dawn of awakening, this outside world begins to collapse. Once we lose our sense of self, it's as if we have lost the whole world as we knew it. At that moment, we suddenly realize with incredible clarity that what we truly are is in no way limited to the small sense of self that we thought we were. What I heard that day was the question, would you uneat the apple? And my immediate response without even thinking was, hell no. Hell no. Because what I have gained along the way I wouldn't give up for anything. Because those moments of breaking open bring us to a place where we understand we can never be diminished by anything that happens out here. And we come to understand that love is not fleeting but eternal. And we come to understand the peace that passes all understanding. And we come to know that the wisdom we gain is more valuable than the innocence we lost. And yes, we have to grieve that. I miss being that ministerial student, so ready to be on the verge of ministry and life. And, and that time served me so well. And... I wouldn't go back there for anything. I would walk through every pain, every heartache, every emotion, every time that brought me to my knees to be where I am now. That is the truth that sets us free. That is the truth that sets us free. So that's the invitation that I offer you today 
because I don't think any one of you would uneat the apple. Because what I see before me are courageous, amazing, wise, spiritual beings. And what I know that whatever is going on in your life, whether it be joy or heartache, that you are being evolved into a greater knowing of God, into a greater knowing of your good. And in that knowing, you will know a love that can never be denied. You will know a truth that can never be altered by anything outside of you, one that you won't give up for anyone or anything. So today, I welcome you for this is your day of resurrection. Namaste.